Deals with a possible presidential bid. The field is set for next week's Republican debate. And is the Iran nuclear deal a done deal? But first, to the analysis of Mark Shields and David Brooks. That's syndicated columnist Mark Shields and New York Times columnist David Brooks. So we just had a segment where we laid out in painful detail how difficult it is for a refugee to gain asylum in the United States. And there are several people who say, you know what, if it wasn't for the United States foreign policy of perhaps disbanding the Iraqi army, creating a, a tremendous amount of regional instability that perhaps in, uh, fueled ISIS, destabilized Syria further, and has caused this migrant crisis. Is the United States responsible, or should they be more responsible in taking more asylum seekers? Uh, yeah, I'd be one of those people. <laughs> you know, I, I think all the things you mentioned, and then you know, a couple of years ago, we had a big debate about Syria and whether we should be helping the moderates. The moderates such as they are in Syria and whether we should arm those moderates and people like John McCain and Lindsey Graham said yes. Eventually the current administration did arm them but with very little, much too late. And so you had this war between Assad's forces and ISIS. And so it, I do think it was partially our, the vacuum created by the U.S. and the West uh, when there was still some sort of moderate solution possible that helped create this crisis and therefore we have a responsibility to take in more refugees. It's still though bizarre to me that most of the debate is on this side of the pipeline, the flow of people on the receiving end. There are hundreds of millions, not hundreds, but there are a lot of millions of people in Syria. Are they all going to come? I mean, what about dealing with that Syria there and creating safe havens, creating places where people can go to be safe when you get islands of stability inside these two evil forces? Uh, I agree with uh 100% with 50% of what David said. <laughs> um, I, I, I think that uh, it didn't begin with the United States uh, withdrawal from Iraq. It began with the United States invasion uh, of Iraq and the entire destabilization of the region. Um, and there's no question that Iran was strengthened by the United States invasion of Iraq, that uh, sectarian violence was in, uh, encouraged, uh, and uh, that the destabilization. Uh, as far as uh, our United States commitment to Syria, uh, it certainly has been halting. Uh, but part of that halting has been lack of any domestic political support as a consequence of what happened in Iraq. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was just an unmitigated disaster. But th the reality is that the moral leadership of the planet, or at least of the Western world right now, is found in Berlin and Stockholm. Uh, Germany and Sweden are, are, have stepped up and, and people say, oh, well, it's in the self-interest of Germany. It is in the self-interest of Germany to take talented, energetic, able, committed people uh, who have the resources, the initiative and the, and the strength to get out. It's a tragedy, as David makes the point, that uh, this nation the size of Syria, four million people have left the country. I mean, that is a, that's a stain on us, and it's a stain on all of, uh, all of civilized world that we've allowed that to continue. All right, let's take a look at the Iran deal. There were uh, kind of machinations in both sides of Congress this week, one side saying, hey, there's this uh, opportunity for you to pass this up or down. The other one saying, uh, how, how about you block that it not passes forward? I mean, it was, you know, it was just one of those moments where you realize, what are you really voting for? And how often is this going to come up? Is this going to become like the Affordable Care Act, where Republicans will continue to fit, try to figure out ways to stop uh, any progress on it? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's, first of all, bizarre that you pass something with a minority, especially when you pass what is effectively a treaty with a minority. Uh, treaties are supposed to be ratified by two-thirds, but now we've got, like, uh, 42 or whatever it was uh, and so but that's the way the situation was set up and once the Republicans agreed that the only Obama the administration only needed a third of the votes in the mm -hmm. Senate to pass the thing then it was going to be a done deal he was going to get a third uh, and so they got that uh, and a little more, little more. Uh, and so uh, the Republicans are going to hang whatever happens in the Middle East on this uh, on this treaty uh, and not only whether Iran gets a nuclear uh, option or whether they begin to cheat or fudge with the inspectors. But the most immediate effect, and whether it postpones an, an Iranian nuclear program, yes, it probably does. But there is an immediate negative effect, and that is you're enriching a power that funds Hezbollah. Uh, and so as, for example, Syria deteriorates, and as, if Hezbollah gets stronger, uh, then the Iranian regime will probably be funding it more and more, and that will be a knockoff of this deal. And so the Republicans will be able to use that. Uh, I think it's a legitimate argument against something the administration did that, did that at least in the short term destabilized the Middle East. Uh, Iran was two to three months away from uh, nuclear capability. 
that's the best estimate of the people that uh, I, I pay attention to and will in a position of leadership. Um, and the reality is now that they are now at least 10 years away. Um, they, they, their own uh, their own capacity uh, at Iraq uh, will be uh, will in fact uh, be de uh, decommissioned. Um, but I, uh, the politics here are entirely different. David's right um, in, in the legislative office, Terry. You can never get in trouble by voting against something that passes. You can say, well, I was going to make it better. Um, or voting for something that doesn't pass. Uh, the same thing, because there's no responsibility. This was a mirror vote of the Iraqi war vote. Uh, ever since that vote, uh, people who voted against it said we were right. And the people who voted for it and supported that war have been on the defensive. Uh, and Lindsey Graham was very blunt. He said, it's all, it's all the Democrats now. It's theirs. Um, and uh, it's everything that happens, uh, the, whole, the whole deal. I, I happen to think it's a, it's a good step. It's a positive step. Uh, I agree with Prime Minister uh, Cameron. I agree with uh, Chancellor Merkel uh, and President Hollande. Uh, mm -hmm. this, this is the best step. These are nations that know war uh, from their own people's experience on their own home fronts. Uh, so I, I, I do think it's uh, the, the reality politically here is that uh, what had been uh, bipartisan overwhelming support for Israel has been politicized and I think basically by Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, who endorsed <coughs> Mitt Romney in 2012 and uh, who as a campaign event and stunt for himself wangled an invitation from a Republican Congress to come and speak to the Congress and use it as a campaign post basically to criticize the policy of the President of the United States. And uh, I, I think that there's been a, a wedge now uh, between what had been overwhelming bipartisan support for Israel and I think quite frankly the responsibility lies with Mr. Netanyahu. I, I agree with that last point. But I, on the Iran deal, we. I, if we conceded that Iran was going to get a nuclear weapon and there was no way we could stop them, then maybe this was a good treaty to sign. I don't think it was important necessarily to concede that. I don't think it was inevitable. I think we sort of conceded a defeat, basically, too early when the sanctions could have avoided that defeat. But the larger issue here with both the Syrian and the Iranian thing is sometimes when you lean in and do something, you get blamed for it, the Iraq war. Sometimes when you lean out and don't do anything, you get blamed for it, Syria. And so, so, you know, you got to have a foreign policy that is very tied to the circumstance at hand. Is this a smart move in this particular space? My problem, you know, in retrospect with the Bush administration, they were like leaning in all the time. My problem with the Obama administration, they're leaning out all the time. And so neither are that context specific. And I think, I think that's just a lesson we've learned from the last two administrations. All right. Uh, shifting gears now to Vice President Biden. Uh, on, on Monday, he seemed to make, on Labor Day, almost a, a campaign rally-like speech. And then he had an appearance on the, the Late Show with Stephen Colbert last night. Well, let's, let's play a clip. I don't think any man or woman should run for president unless, number one, they know exactly why they would want to be president, and two, they can look at the folks out there and say, I promise you, you have my whole heart, my whole soul, my energy, and my passion to do this. And, and I'd be lying if I said that I knew I was there. The cynical side of folks says, you know what, this is a politician. He's got a great opportunity here. And there's obviously the other side that he's in the midst of incalculable grief. In this campaign in 2016, Joe Biden's greatest weakness, uh, that is he talks, he, he says what he thinks off the cuff, he isn't filtered, is his greatest strength. I urge, which I've never done before on this broadcast, everybody to watch that exchange, that interview with S Stephen Colbert. Stephen Colbert, in my judgment, proved himself to be a national resource last night. It, I was like eavesdropping on a very intimate, personal conversation between two people on subjects of great and intense importance to them uh, emotionally. I, I just thought it was, uh, it, it was phenomenal uh, in, in the sense that he was just as open, uh, as emotionally 
accessible, however you want to put it. I mean, it, it was it, it was a great strength of his, what has been sort of Joe tells you and Joe tells too much. Joe spoke last night from the heart and in this campaign with positioning and focus groups and readjusting and all the rest of it, I, I got to tell you, it was refreshing. It, it was a really moving and beautiful moment. It reveals what a beautiful man he was. But to me, surprisingly, it reveals that maybe he does have an opening this year. You know, Hillary, my mm -hmm. newspaper earlier in the week had a story that Hillary Clinton has a has a plan to become more spontaneous. Uh, and so, <laughs> Organized spontaneous. Yeah, and, and, but Joe Biden is sincere down to the bones. He's always sincere, sometimes to a fault. Mm -hmm. uh, but that sincerity comes through. And that may actually play this year. It's, it's a little counterpolitical in a weird way to be that sincere. But that's who he is. And so that may actually work. Also, he's become more disciplined. He used to, when you would cover a Joe Biden rally, he'd give a great speech, and then he'd follow it with a second speech, and a third speech, and a fourth speech, and they'd get declinely good, or bad, or whatever, <laughs> decline. Uh, but so he's more disciplined by the vice presidency. He's had to be. And so I'm, I'm beginning to think, you know, there's an opening. And it's just testament to two men who had severe losses in their lives Boy, yeah, in yeah. conversation. So uh, finally, uh, the debates, the, the, the platforms are set for next week. Carly Fiorina moves up to the, the uh, kind of the, the, the marquee event uh, and not the warm-up show. Mm -hmm. um, but somebody is dropping out. We talked about Rick Perry today. I want to just pull a, a quote out of one of his, his concession speech or his, his departure speech. Uh, Demeaning people of Hispanic heritage is not just ignorant, it betrays the example of Christ. Um, and I think he's referring specifically to Donald Trump here and he's, he goes on it's time to elevate our debate from divisive name calling from sound bites without solutions yes I mean uh, th there's no question he's talking about Donald Trump there he had uh, harsh words back and forth between the two men um, but Rick Perry spent uh, the last two years preparing for this race but it comes down to you, you, Sadly, you don't very rarely get a second chance to make a first impression. And oops, in the three departments he was going to abolish, uh, dogged him, and uh, he, he, that, that's the reason. But on the way out, he certainly gave Mr. Trump a salute. He ran a much better campaign this time. Some a good speech on African Americans, a good mm -hmm. speech on Hispanics, much better campaign, worse outcome. Uh, it's too bad. On the debates, I think Jeb Bush, this is a debate where he's got a, he's leaking air. Uh, and so I think the pressure's on him more than anybody else in this debate. I, I agree. I, I'd say this. Everybody knew Donald Trump in the fourth grade. I mean, the, the bully. And uh, if you correct him or criticize him in any way, you're stupid, uh, you're dumb, uh, you're ugly. That's what he accused uh, Carly Farouna of being, being this week. Um, and uh, I, I think he may have stepped one, one step beyond. Um, I, if Carly Fiorina is disqualified because of her looks, what, what does that mean Donald Trump would say about Golda Meir? Uh, or Angela Merkel, uh, Mother Teresa. I mean, it just tells you something about the depth of the man. Um, and I, I think that it's really going to be determined. Rubio and Kasich have hidden from him. Uh, <clears throat> Cruz has tried to be his best buddy, his closest friend. Scott Walker tried to emulate him and fell flat on his face. Jeb Bush has decided he's going to take on the bully. And I think uh, Chris Christie will throw a haymaker on the way out. Yeah. I mean, it's, I think it's going to be... It's not going to be ballroom dancing. It's going to be a slugfest. All right. Mark Shields, David Brooks, thanks so much.